How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Brian? <laughs> I'm, I'm great. Uh, thanks for inviting us into your studio. No, uh, thanks for coming along. I'm sure this is like a privilege that a limited few can. Yeah, you know what? You're actually right. I'm actually so, like, my, my space, my working space yeah. is very private and personal. Yeah. So I don't actually let lots of people in here. Yeah. Yeah. But COVID is literally. <laughs> thankfully, thankfully. Um, I've been following your work for a couple of years. And it's always uh, caught my eye. It's always fascinating. Mm. Would you say what you do is like high fashion? Uh, you know what? Like if we're going to use terms that people are familiar with and are yeah. comfortable with, then yeah, I'll probably say it is high fashion. But I think it's mostly the way I express myself visually yeah. that then takes my fashion to the next level. But I'll ultimately say that my work is ready to wear. Um, if you literally look at the pieces and dissect them and look at them as separate individual pieces, yeah. anyone can wear them. But all the time people think, like, oh my gosh, it's such a complicated garment or it's too like <laughs> fancy. Yeah. And I'm like, no guys, it's just <laughs> the way I present my work, I always try to do everything with a standard of excellence. Um, and not only that, I try to expand people's imaginations of where they can go with their fashion as much as it's ordinary clothing, you don't need to exist in a bland life. Life doesn't have to be bland. So I think that's yeah. pretty much what people get when they look at my work, um, that then they interpret into, it must be high fashion. High fashion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be fair, uh, for me, it was, I think it was like the easiest label mm. uh, that came to me as someone who's like not in fashion. I saw it and mm. I was like, Yo, this is so cool, but yeah. it doesn't look like uh, the stuff that we wear like every day. I went to fashion school, and to be very honest with you, yeah. I actually am anti labels in general, um, in terms of like using terms to define people. Sometimes I actually find that those terms are more for other people so that they can classify you, but I also find them to be quite limiting in their explanation and expression yeah. of what something is or even who an individual is so yeah we'll work with high fashion but <laughs> for me but it's, it's, it, more, it's more it's than that than it's that. broader than that yeah yeah mm. yeah and fashion zim that's a it's a it's an interesting one because it's not really like the most common career choices isn't it and mm. when did you decide that you wanted to work in the fashion industry and what informed that passion? I think it was a series of life events and connections or encounters that I had with creators that were actually in fashion. Yeah. From a local perspective, it was definitely designers like Ska Sebata, who at the time, I think she was referred to as Ska Sebata Couture before anyone knew what Couture was in Zim. <laughs> and by the way, you don't just go around calling things Couture, but you yeah. know, you learn, you're seeing things on television, you're like, I think that's I my think vibe. Right. Um, but that's a conversation another day about the custodianship and the gatekeepingness of term terminology, yeah. which comes from the West, which I think is also problematic that we have to go through this thing that some of us don't have access to, to be able to call ourselves something. Yeah. But as I said, that's a conversation for another day. Um, <laughs> But yeah, encounters with Ska Sebata, designers like Moita Marimo, um, we bumped into each other at a French class because the moment you want to become a fashion designer, everyone thinks Paris, especially back in the days, everyone was like, oh, if you're a fashion designer, you have to go to Paris. That's where you go. Um, that was the mindset of that time. I'm making my sound, self sound very old. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the mindset. And yeah. then it was Nigerian designer referred to as Sego Diola. Excuse me if I pronounced it wrong, yeah. but I love her. Naturally. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I saw her on CNN, and her work was very like, I'll refer to it as avant garde African. Yeah. Um, an interpretation of that that is closer to home would be Ivu Tribe, if you've ever heard of them. Research them, know them, know your people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you check them out. I don't think I actually have seen Yeah, um, it was almost like costume in a sense, but with African batik print, um, very out there and outrageous, but what drew me to it was the expression of it and the fact that this designer from Nigeria is now on this international platform like CNN, such an exclusive yeah. space where <laughs> not anyone can just be on CNN. If you're CNN, then you are the business. Worldwide. You're, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're legitimate, right? 
And in that moment, I felt like, you know what, I think this could be a possible career path for me. Yeah. But not knowing that I think in a sense, fashion was also ingrained in my bloodline. Because even when I look at, if I really took the time to actually look at my ancestry and things that my that my grandmother used to do and my aunts, my aunt was a seamstress, my grandmother was always just making us stuff. Yeah. And this was something that I experienced while growing up, but it wasn't something that I was really cognitive of. It was just something that I was subconsciously taking, taking in, in, not realizing that it was actually also inputting into me and my future calling and purpose in life. Mm. So when I look at all those events that took place, then there was that aha moment of say, go Diola, and I was like, I think I can do this as a career. Yeah. Um, and, it, and maybe just yeah. for context, sorry mm. for cutting you off, just for it's context, okay. like uh, when was this, like the CNN stuff? Uh, Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> wow, I'm so bad with my dates. Could have been 2010 thereabouts. Yeah. We'll, we'll go with or that. Or further back. <laughs> it could be further back. I'm so bad with my dates. Yeah. Never ask me anything. Um, <laughs> that's date specific. <laughs> that's date specific. Um, was it 2004? 2010, 2004 are very separate. They're very far yeah, apart it's from like each other. Half a decade. <laughs> but um, it was back then. All I know is it was more than a decade ago. It was yeah. definitely more than yeah. a decade ago in my, in my career, um, before I even started, obviously. But yeah, it was a while yeah. back. It was, it was the early, early days of fashion. That's interesting. Mm. And, and when I was researching into you, um, <clears throat> I came across something that said you studied at, is it Lysoff or mm. Lysoff? I don't know how Yeah, I, 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 I called it Lysoff. Lysoff. Uh, it Let's was initially called the London <laughs> International School of Fashion and yeah. then eventually just became Lysoff. Yeah, I think mm. now it's actually Stadio. Yeah, I think they sold it. I don't know. <laughs> a lot is happening with that one. But, that's a whole different thing. But that's a place to watch because some of the yeah. best African designers, South African designers, came out of that institute. Oh, for real? Mm -hmm, like and the rich Minisis and all of that, the Tebe Magugus, like... Yeah, quite a lot of impactful young African creatives um, came out of that space. So they did their Kudos thing. Kudos to them. I just Kudos saw you them. and that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they did their job then if, they, if you saw me and you thought it was good, yeah. Um, and, and so the question I was going to ask you is, what are some of the things that you took from an institution like that that you might not have had if you... Uh, let's say if you got to practice fashion without going down that route. As an individual, I need to be in a controlled environment in order to learn technical things. I think it's only with time and maturity that I've been able to, in a sense, teach myself stuff. Yeah. Um, but when I was younger, I really required that controlled environment where someone's saying this is how you make a pattern now go off here's your homework yeah. I, I think uh coming from a structure like zim where everything is in a sense sort of rigid yeah. i then became <laughs> rigid so i needed that institutional space in order for me to learn the technical skills but aside from that nothing because <laughs> i'm really going to tell you the truth yeah <laughs> I came into myself as a designer probably maybe like five years after I left oh. university. So I'll say yeah. graduated, worked for three years, came back, started something. Yeah, probably eight years um, is when I actually found my voice as a creative. I found that when I was in an institution, because it was so controlled, even my ideas and my creativity to an extent were being yeah. controlled by the lecturers or by the gatekeepers of that specific space yeah. where they dictate who's it, who's not it, what's trending, what's not trending. And you don't actually realize that it stifles your voice because as a Zimbo, when you've been set on a, an agenda to go get a degree, yeah. You go get your degree, right? <laughs> so in really a sense, my priority was not creativity. My priority was I like, came here with an agenda. The agenda was get your degree. So if the lecturer says step left, even though you want to go right, this is not mm. an argument. We don't argue. You're stepping left. You step left, <laughs> even though it feels iffy to you. So yeah. it was actually quite stifling for my creativity because I was more concerned about making, ensuring that I graduated um, from that space. Yeah. And it was only later that I realized that there was so much more that I could have taken away from that space with perhaps career guidance in advance of, okay, what to other additional things that someone can focus on 
when they're at institutions like institutions are a great place to network with people that you yeah. might never have an opportunity to meet yeah. ever like again. Leader in life. <laughs> people from different walks of life convene at institutions yeah. like that. You know, rich, poor, influential, all of that stuff. That's a great op space for you to connect with like-minded people and even sometimes people that don't even think like you. Yeah, they challenge you as well. Exactly, yeah. and you use those networks in your future, in your actual career, yeah. um, which was stuff that I was completely... <laughs> I mean, it's hard to see was, at the time, to blase, be fair. I was completely blasé. I was just like, I was just sitting here to get a degree yeah. and then get a job. Like, you know, there's this formula that you follow. You follow. And you forget that there are also other things that you can be doing that are within those spaces that add to your journey as a creative that will yeah. impact you even in your professional career. Yeah. So yeah. for me, I came into myself creatively. My expression came out not at university, but afterwards, afterwards yeah. when I sort of like threw away all like the rules. Because I think I got angry. And then I was like, I'm just throwing away all these rules. I'm going to do my own thing and be a rebel. <laughs> so yeah, that was the energy that I was carrying at some point. You were moving with that. Mm. Aggressive energy. I know. Um, Go to school, kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late for that. I know, right? After I just had that spiel of like, nothing. <laughs> but, but to be fair, it's, there's also a sincerity to mm. that, uh, to, to say that um, we go to these institutions, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but mm. sometimes the approach yeah. uh, people take into the institutions mm. doesn't necessarily really aid. Yeah. And... A lot of the time, we're told not to question things, right? Especially that. Um, especially from like a black African c cultural, you don't really question don't those question in authority. Your, your elders. And it's only now, I think, um, the, I referred to them earlier, Gen Z are the ones that question everything. Yeah, it's us. Uh, you guys are the ones that question everything. Um, and in a way, it's, it's, it's beautiful and scary at the same time. Um, but I think that's, attitude of questioning things, questioning why is this like that? Why are we doing it like that? Why have I been told? Why has this person been given authority over me? What makes us know that this person knows more? And obviously, look, there are certain ways in which in the past we were able to classify those things. Yeah. But now it's becoming a lot more blurry to be able to determine why someone has been given authority yeah. over you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, over your thoughts, over your expression. And for me, that's always been something that I've fought against. Um, in terms of trying to be authentic and true to who I am, what yeah. sets me on fire and what I believe I have been made for to contribute into this world that will yeah. affect other individuals beyond myself. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so <clears throat> you said something interesting there is uh, at a certain point, mm. you got angry and yeah. <laughs> you started doing you. Mm. <laughs> you started <laughs> yeah, like rebel. <laughs> Uh, was that like a, a collective, was that like a thing where you look at things and you look at a bunch of events and you're like, mm. okay, this doesn't make sense. I have to change the way I'm living. Or was it like a single event, if you can even speak about it, that just pushed mm. you over the edge and you're like, nah. You know what? I think for me, it was a culmination of events, but then there'll always be that singular thing that almost like pushes you over and, real and you realize that, okay, I need to start walking in my, my truth. I think the first thing that triggered me was I realized that I was pandering to trends, pandering to aesthetics, and rather than contributing something new and fresh to the conversation, I was yeah. simply regurgitating what already existed. Yeah. And as someone that had studied fashion, you know, sometimes when you study something, you can think you know everything, <laughs> right? But um, as someone that also studied it, I, I felt like, where's the education? Um, that I spent so much money on, where is it now in the actual working space? And the actual fashion working space is about make clothing that sells. It's a business, yeah. ultimately. ultimately. All that creativity, all that fuddy-duddy stuff that we learned at uni just didn't seem to be apparent <laughs> within, specifically within the Zimbabwean fashion space. Nobody cared about the intellectual side of fashion. Yeah, um, like what, do these, what do these garments mean? Yeah, what do they mean? <laughs> what is the narrative behind it? Like doing things with intentionality beyond just aesthetic and trend. So for me, that was the frustration that I found myself in a space where, yeah, I was actually quite popular at that time and I could have ridden that wave, but something was 
so heavy on my heart at that time that I was like, I could keep at it and probably make a lot of money. Mm. But at the same time, I feel like I have more to say, something more tangible that will live beyond me and really impact and contribute towards that African narrative. When people look back, they can be like, yo, there was this Zimbabwean designer who was, yeah. who was doing this. <laughs> and these were the narratives and this is what they signified. Um, and it becomes a conversation that goes beyond just the physical clothing, but the spirit of the clothing <laughs> and everything that's happening. Yeah. 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 And, and so let's, um, let's talk about House of Stone like mm. more specifically now because mm. I think it's, it's, is it fair to say that's what you've now become, what you've come to be known for? I would uh, say it is fair. It's fair? <laughs> <laughs> I would say it is fair and yeah. for the longest time, you know, being a creative, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, especially in an environment that really wants to classify you in a certain space uh, yeah. or in a certain way. way. Um, initially, I was speaking on how I was pandering to what people wanted me to create. And I actually used to deal a lot with African print. Yeah. And then the thing that broke me then was someone called me an African print designer. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, take me down, Jesus! <laughs> like, that, being classified as that scared me more than anything. Yeah. And when I look back at it, the reason why it scared me is because it was not putting me in a box. Whereas I was still on a journey of self-discovery. Yeah. I just happened to be doing it publicly <laughs> because I was actually now yeah. selling the stuff and putting it underneath this brand of House of Stone and this is what we do. Um, but that wasn't where I was. All of a sudden, you're and now there's like nothing the wrong. Print yeah, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with African print designers, but I it's knew it was not doing. me. And yeah. I knew that was not the conversation that I wanted to share and I knew that we shouldn't even be calling these prints African African Yeah I, I heard someone say <laughs> Aztec and it's, it's so very many complex. things. It's just not us. Okay. <laughs> that's an, also the different conversation that we could have later as well yeah. because it's one of those things of whereby when people adopt something that isn't actually from them how much ownership then do they have do of they it? Have. Has it now become their things? Is it now theirs? Or is it something that they're also appropriating? Like, you know, there are just it's so many complex. conversations that one could have around that in, yeah. in itself. But yeah, um, House of Stone, yes, I am known as Madame <laughs> House of Stone now. <laughs> um, and I try to run away from it, as I mentioned. Yeah. Um, because I, I think I'm an individual that hates being boxed or classified as a singular thing because yeah. I know I'm so malleable and organic and ever evolving and my interests are expansive, you know? Yeah. So those have always been things where it's, now I'm trying, to, I've learned actually how to block off commentary because ultimately that's all it actually is, it's yeah. commentary. <laughs> but if you let it sink into you, then that's when the and true definition sticks. Define, define. Um, so, yeah, being putting your work out there publicly, knowing what people say, um, it can be quite jarring to the creative that is creating. So I always say, stay away from those kind of conversations. Just focus on the work. On the focus work. on what it is that you want to yeah. create, and if you're getting the outcome that you so desire out of it. That's great. Mm. <laughs> and it's 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 hilarious you say that because uh, one of the the questions that I'm constantly asked that I hate is. Are you creative? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm constantly saying uh, to people, it doesn't matter what I am. Mm. <laughs> At the end of the day, I want to tell a story mm. and I'm using the medium I think is best. Mm. If tomorrow a new medium comes up that yeah. tells stories better, yeah. we'll switch to that if, mm. we can, if we can do so. That's so true. And, and so it's always amusing that people are so, um, I, guess, I guess the labels make it easier for people to perceive the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, it's for other but people. they're also <laughs> very limiting because it's like yeah. eh, once you're creative, you have to live in a certain way and do certain mm, things. But mm, it's not necessarily mm. always true to you. Yeah. yeah. And so what I was going to ask you is, um, when you started House of Stone, uh, what was the thinking there? When I when I talk to entrepreneurs, I usually ask what was the problem you were trying to solve. Uh, I don't know if that's really applicable to someone like yourself who's mm. in in fashion, but yeah. if it is. What were you trying to get at with, uh, with House of Stone? Actually, everything with House of Stone when it started initially was more just birthed out of wanting to create something. And I was 
one thing I had noticed that I found so problematic was there were no Zimbabwean creatives that I knew of at the time within the yeah. fashion space on an international stage. So I was like, if I create a fashion label, I want to be like representing Zim, they ought to know we exist. <laughs> what, what. Yeah. So for me, it was almost like that national pride. But when I came back to Zimbabwe to actually start House of Stone, like probably like a business, it was quite personal in that I actually wanted to establish in a sense a portfolio that could showcase I guess employees mm -hmm. that I can design and then suddenly I'm now realizing that oh this thing has taken off I didn't actually think it was going to become oh so you weren't setting off to like yeah. employ yourself essentially <laughs> you I really wasn't I really was like let me just do this thing Right yeah. and show people what I can do. It was almost just to prove a point and be like, "Hey, this is what I've managed to do." And then suddenly now I was actually in it, you know. And I was like, "Oh, okay, so it's actually become something," you know. Um, but I think that was also the problem is that it was never truly properly planned out as a business, and I think that's why um, I ended up experiencing burnout, frustration. Um, because I set out on the agenda to create a portfolio, but then that portfolio became an actual business. business. But yeah. the business that actually didn't have an actual business plan <laughs> or structure. It wasn't as intentional as it, it should It wasn't be. as intentional as it should have been. So I experienced a lot of backlash from that lack of preparedness. Um, yeah, la not, yeah, lack of preparedness. That's what it was. Um, and structure yeah. that was just lacking completely there. So... How <laughs> So <laughs> that's interesting because <laughs> how long does it take you to gather yourself when, so essentially you're, from, from what you're saying, I'm getting that you're essentially blowing up at the same time, you're in chaos, you're like deep in chaos. Perfect. <laughs> that's, as you said, that's it. I was literally in chaos. And because um, I was now just, on this thing, on the on the right of this thing, like I was, no, I was no longer driving the car. I was just driving itself, and I just happened to be in it. Just going downhill. That was literally, <laughs> literally, that was Breaks it. That was literally it. I was now in this car, and it was driving itself. I didn't know where we were going, but I was in it, and I couldn't get out. The door was locked. And I was like, let me out, please, let me out. Uh, um, and I didn't, yeah, I did not step out, and then eventually burnout happened, and. I remember telling my family, like, I'm done with this thing. I don't want to design anymore. I hate designing. Yeah. Um, and I just don't want to see anything that has to do with the designing again. And I remember saying, I'm going to make an announcement on social media that I'm quitting. You know how it is when you're like young, you're so impulsive and emotional yeah. about things and you want to just publicly announce everything <laughs> in your field. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> done. Um, but luckily for me, I was surrounded by people that have wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> far more wisdom than I had at the time, at, the time. at least. But like, you know what? Don't say anything. Just set it aside. Do something completely different. Revisit it. And I think it was because people that were close to me saw something that I didn't see. Yeah. Um, in everything that I was doing, as well as me, the individual. Um, because I was so caught up in it, I couldn't actually see anything i was just blind and just yeah, tired burnt out and just not understanding <laughs> what was going on how something can be so amazing it's so terrible yeah. at the same time it's like the, the, like this the, is everything i wanted but yeah, at the same time. yeah so i took the break and i did do something completely different and it was so refreshing yeah. and it also speaks back to just my general ethos of trying to just promote creatives within zimbabwe to the world yeah. Um, and that was the focus. And I, I realized that what I ended up doing, uh, which was Isu Collections, which was a retail space to promote um, Zimbabwean desired lifestyle products, was meeting a need that I was struggling with when I was still a designer, yeah. which was not having a retail space for local fashion creatives. I was like, why not do that just for everyone in the lifestyle space where they can have a, a proudly yeah. Zimbabwean space where they can go to and just purchase local product? Um, and I loved it because I got to meet lots of amazing people. Yeah. Uh, I got to buy lots of amazing stuff. I was getting high <laughs> off my own supply. <laughs> you know, when your shop has got amazing yeah, product, now you're like, yeah, I want to buy that. Okay, stop buying everything. <laughs> you become that obsessive. Yeah, but that was an amazing season for me as well. It was incredible. Um, just seeing the amount of creativity that was there and just to see this surge within the creative space and to 
be a part of it and to contribute towards it in some way really impacted my life incredibly and just as how I move in life yeah. um, and in my career. Yeah. And so that, that's amazing, right? So you've found this uh, other outlet, for, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Uh, what then brings you back to the fashion after you've thrown all your toys out the pram? Oh, wow. Okay. Bring me back to the darkness <laughs> that is fashion. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I actually got pregnant. I found out I was pregnant. And I realized that I hadn't fully done what I wanted to do within fashion. Um, and the idea of quitting was not something that I wanted to be my story. I didn't want that to be my narrative that I just quit on something and I didn't actually at least try. Um, a couple of times, and I didn't want that to be the story that I shared with my yeah. unborn child. Like, it sounds so, like, poetic, like, oh, you know. It really does. Finally, but genuinely, that's how I felt. I was just like, ah, oh, I'm pregnant. I don't have time to play like this. Like, get on with Wake it, girl, call. you know. And one thing that I told myself was I'm not going to put pressure on myself to be anything. I'm not going to put pressure on myself for my truth, the things that set me on fire to be anything to anyone but me. I want to create from the soul, from my spirit inside. Yeah. And strangely enough, at the, around about the same time, I was actually meant to go to the Nelson Mandela, um, like a Nelson Mandela program that I had yeah. been accepted into. But then I didn't get a visa. Boo-hoo. Wow. Y'all owe me a visa. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a visa. And actually, funny enough, at that time, I was so crushed. So I was like, yeah. oh. You know what I mean? I'm trying to go there. I want to learn so I can better improve my business and all of that. Um, and then I didn't get it. And I remember feeling so low. And I was pregnant as well in the early, early stages. And I was like, I'm not a person who just sits on my bum and waits to be saved. I don't do that. Yeah. I, I don't. I'm not going to sit here and be saved. What do I have in my hands? What can I do? And boom, inspiration came my way. That's why I said that sometimes... It is true. Sometimes people are just in that state of emotional chaos and all of that's happening. And suddenly this idea comes yeah. and you're like, that's what that's I'm going to do. One. And I moved <laughs> and I've never moved so swiftly, so effortlessly. Even when I think about the money for that collection to create, I don't even know where I got the money from. The people that came together as a collaboration to help me create um, that collection that I created called Ode to Ascana. Yeah. Um, the team was beautiful. Everything was just so seamless, so effortless. It was, that's why I actually call that my spirit-led collection. And that's why I actually now refer to myself as an intuitive designer. Because it, I moved so intuitively. All those things that I talk about in terms of when you go to school and there's a process that you follow in creating a collection doesn't exist with me. <laughs> I was like, what do I like? And I remember putting it on a mood board. I like that. I like that. I like this. I like that. I like that. And yeah. suddenly I was like, okay, what am I going to create um, from this thing? What was I seeing? And then everything that I was seeing when I was collecting my visuals and saying, this is what I like. This is what I like. How am I going to interpret this? Um, where do I want to shoot? And all of that stuff. Um, it was so seamless. It was like someone was literally like, yeah, just <laughs> dropping it into my head Goop, guiding Goop, the steps <laughs> and I was just like guys like it sounds nuts <laughs> but when you haven't actually like had that experience, experience yeah. um it ca can sound nuts but literally like I just leaned deeply into what set me on fire and I said this is what I like this is my taste and I trusted my taste um I think artists have naturally been given Superior taste. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that's a banger. <laughs> <laughs> We've been given taste. Not only artists, but people in general have been given taste. So with your tastes, what will you create? You know, yeah. with those tastes and then redistribute for others to also enjoy that thing, you yeah. know? Yeah. So that's what I did. I leaned into my taste and then I went bananas over my own taste. And I said, I don't care if anyone rates <laughs> Doesn't this. Doesn't like this or not. This <laughs> is the bomb. And I kept saying to myself and to everyone, if you don't like this, I'm just too ahead of you right now. <laughs> and I know that sounds like, look, I feel like I'm challenging like Kanye a, West yeah, right exactly. now, right? But <laughs> I think that's why I like it. Easy, because easy. sometimes, you know what, as a creative, 
there is this thing that they say there is a knowing. And when you create, you just need to know and you just need to like what you're creating. You just yeah. need to be excited about your stuff before anybody else will be excited about it. It starts with the creator, right? Yeah. It starts with you. Um, and if you're not reading your work, then get rid of it. You have to be on fire about your own stuff because then yeah. how are you going to go out there and even and try to convince, convince anyone, <laughs> anyone else that it's you fire? You know, it. and it's true. Sometimes as creatives, you are ahead of your time. Sometimes you're even ahead of your space. But when you are convinced, you will know eventually that thing will manifest into what it's meant to be yeah. at the right time. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did we get here? How did we... I don't know. <laughs> We were talking about yeah, you we coming doing? back oh, yeah. to House of Stone. Yeah, so, so yeah. my baby, my baby got <laughs> pregnant. And then I was like, nah, that's not going to be my narrative. And then I just ran with it. I called all the people that I'd worked with previously that I just had a good sense would be able to add so much value and strength to yeah. it. Uh, one of those individuals was Ngoni Chinara, known as Zash Craft Online. What's up, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely going to look for him. <laughs> um, and we work so well together. He takes the time to understand a vision. Not only does he take the time to understand a vision, he takes the time to have ownership of that vision. There's a lot of separation sometimes when an individual comes to another creative yeah. with an idea. It's almost like, ah, that's your idea. Yeah. So, yeah, you're gonna make bank you know, <laughs> I'll take pictures of it. But we had like several meetings. We went to the location together. We sort of, we just looked at, it was the most, it was, it's so strange. It seems like everything that I'm saying is almost opposites of each other. Yeah. But it was the most effortless collection with the least preparation, but the most cohesion, right? Um, so we had several meetings together, like I'd say two, to be honest. Yeah. Two meetings together where we spoke about the collection. We went to the site once together before so we could just see like the space and just pick the spot that we wanted. Um, this guy is exceptional. He then went off, he even created his own poem in terms of what he was receiving from the Probably. collection. Yeah. Um, on the day of the shoot, he even brought music for the model so they could feel the essence of the collection. So when they pose, it's not just like wind blowing, but it's just yeah. they're feeling the, the energy of that. So he's incredible. Um, the ownership that he takes of the work that he's given. Like, I'm yeah. not too sure if he's the same with other people, but with mine, he handled this vision that, that had come to me with such care yeah. and such respect. Um, so that's why it was incredible. And yeah. even everyone else, like, look, I might not have mentioned everyone else, but the models as well. Like, models, my assistant, yeah, the, the, the assistants, imagery. the assistant <laughs> um, photographer, everyone that was there had to be there. Yeah. There was no one that was there by mistake. So, yeah, it was incredible. <laughs> yeah. From, from what I've seen, uh, what's always struck me, uh, about, what's always struck me about that is the visuals are so, like you say, effortless is what they give. It's mm. really, mm. <laughs> that's the energy you mm. get when you see it. It's mm. just so, mm. it's so different. It challenges you, I think, yeah. or at least it did for me. And <clears throat> I'm going to take you back a bit, uh, even before House of Stone. Uh, there's something you said in, in a separate interview mm -hmm. where you said that the, the fashion ecosystem you experienced upon uh, coming back to Zim mm -hmm. in 2014 was very different from mm -hmm. what you had experienced mm -hmm. prior. What differences were you starting to see when you came back? Well, there were no structures. There was no fashion environment. Um, there were no fashion designers, everyone was kind of just classified into one group, tailors, seamstresses, designers, um, anyone that dealt with clothing, even retailers, suddenly mm. they're Zimbabwean mm -hmm. fashion brands. <laughs> and it's like, but it's a retailer getting stuff from China and just redistributing it in the retail. Yeah. That's completely different. Um, we didn't have a fashion design culture like that of South Africa. And even then, in South Africa, when I had left it, they were still talking themselves as babies. Yeah. Yet when you come to Zimbabwe, we had the arrogance yeah. to be like, Tashika, Tashika, like, we, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, we I had this, Zim thing we had this arrogance <laughs> of thinking that our fashion scene is something hot. And I'm like, this is just ridiculous. We don't even have industry. Like, 
people have lost many jobs. How are we reclaiming those jobs that have been lost? Yeah. And if we're not reclaiming them and people are working for themselves, how do we monitor these things? Where are the stats? Where's the, where are the systems, yeah. you know, to make this a viable business, not just for the individuals, but for the nation, for the country, yeah. you know? Um, so coming back to the chaos that was Zimbabwe and also like the lack of knowledge and understanding around the fashion system and what it is where someone will come to a fashion designer and they'll be like, oh, we love your, your, your clothing. Please design me this picture from a magazine. In this moment, I'm going to take the opportunity to educate people that yeah. there's a difference between a designer and a tailor. A designer creates from scratch. They manifest in collaboration with you a completely new garment. Yeah. If you want me to do tailor work, then you actually can come and say, do you do tailor work? And I can be like, you, you know what, sometimes I do tailor work. You know, <laughs> But designers don't do that. Tailors yeah. take things from magazines and they copy. That is in their forte. You know, If you come to a designer, say, can you design me something brand new? What do you have in your catalog? But I think this is a conversation where I'm not even angry at the public for that. They just don't know, just don't know. you know? Yeah. Um, and as creatives and even like our institutions that we're now beginning to form, it's up to us to now actually start educating people. But also people need to also be receptive to that education. Yeah. It's a two-way thing. Um, so yeah, the fashion systems, yeah, it, it's, and so that's what, I, that's what I was going to ask you, <laughs> that <laughs> these were things you were saying in, in 2014. We're in mm. 2022. That's mm. eight, give or take eight years. I'm mm. going to say eight. Mm. <laughs> um, have we made strides? Are there, like, big differences? What's, what's, what's the state of the, what's the lay of the land now? I would say we haven't made strides. People still want cheap, trendy clothing. Um... People are just consuming and following yeah. trends. No one actually is seeking anything that is original, made with quality, made with time. Not only that, the turnovers. People want, like, if someone calls you today, they want a garment tomorrow and they want a ball gown. <laughs> make that make sense. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You're coming yeah. to me with an image of Jean-Paul Gaultier's dress, a ball gown, uh, as an example. You yeah. want it tomorrow. Do you think Jean-Paul Gaultier took one day to make to that? Make and do you think he made it for $50? <laughs> so those yeah. are the conversations that we honestly need to be having with ourselves as consumers. Yeah. And I say as consumers because I'm also a consumer. I don't just wear House of Stone. I yeah. also consume other designers' work and other designs from other places. We need to have these conversations about our consumer habits, right? And why we purchase what we purchase within clothing. It's actually quite unhealthy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's not only, not only is it unhealthy, it's adding to unnecessary waste and unnecessary clothing being made and just disposed of and discarded in yeah. our environment, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> the, the only other person I've talked to on, on our channel who does fashion, mm. literally... Almost word for word said yeah. what you're saying is yeah. that it's, a lot of it is, is too disposable. A yeah, and it's, it people need, disposable. designers also need to stop making cheap clothes. Um, me too. If I'm making cheap clothes, I need to start making cheap clothes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I need to start improving the quality of my clothing so that I can actually charge more and actually take the time to make a garment that someone can actually keep and not only keep, but maybe even hand it down because it's been made that good. There's yeah. a bag that I have from my mother that she used to use when she was my age. Still intact. Quality product. An yeah. heirloom that you can hand out. There is a jacket that I inherited from my dad that he used to wear when he was my age. Quality. Still intact. So I feel like that's where we need to head as creatives. And I understand we're working in an environment where people don't necessarily have disposable income. Mm -hmm. But now maybe that's when I'm talking about changing our buying habits. There was a time when we actually used to save to buy the things that we want, yeah. right? Yeah. It wasn't just like, I need $5, I need $10, $10, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know, we love to speak, Shana. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, no, you yeah, really yeah, are. Yeah, no, like, just to, like, but, um, you know, it wasn't like that, you know? We literally would put our money aside. I know for a fact that I was a very conscious buyer. I actually had very few clothes. I was actually known for repeating clothes a lot. That was actually my thing. Yeah. Um, because I bought things that I wanted to wear. There's no shame in that. Buy things you want to wear. Wear them as much as possible. Yeah. Wear them until their wheels fall off. That's why you purchased it. Other people's opinion of whether they're wearing it too much, that's the, that problem lies with, with them. them. 
that thing is serving the purpose in your life, it's functioning the way it's supposed to function in your life, be more intentional about the things you buy. Like, I would literally say for jackets. Yeah. And be like, I'm buying this jacket. Then people would be like, hey, how can you pay, buy a jacket that costs that much? I'm like, hey, my jacket's still hot 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 yeah. years from now. <laughs> I'm still looking dope, you know? So it's just those kind of conversations that I think we need to just start having within the Zimbabwean fashion space. And hopefully we'll see improvement. Yeah, God willing. Hopefully mm, we do. Mm, Hopefully mm. we do. And so one of the things you touched on there is <clears throat> sustainability. Mm. And tying with that is another thing you said. Mm. Damn, I always sound like a stalker, man. It's like, you said this, you said that. You said we this. love it. You're the kind of journalists we need in this country. The ones that actually do their research, not just print any old, oh, those ones drive me bananas. I ain't even mad at you. That means you love what you do. Yeah, yeah. But, mm. you know, previously mm. you've, you've mentioned that... Um, initially being a sustainable designer wasn't actually like part of your plan it wasn't mm. something you you mm. intended mm. but your hand was was kind of forced and that mm. sounds like an interesting story what was going on there um struggle when you're an independent fashion designer trying to sustain a fashion business out of this country specifically from my experience it makes sense for you to go the sustainable route uh, to maximize on the resources that you have and funny enough sustainability speaks to being resourceful uh, what do you have? Okay, so you have a whole bunch. You've bought like material, let's say, for example, yeah. um, five meters. You've cut out your kimono and that kimono has left off cuts. Now, if you take those off cuts and you patch them up together, hey, I actually have one extra kimono that you can now actually cut out of that. You've actually made an, an extra garment for less. Yeah. But it's a better quality garment because now it's also taking more time. It's also taking your creativity to think of how are you going to cut these shapes so that they're actually interesting and creative. And not only that, you also then begin to create unique pieces where people don't need to look like um, replicas of each other. People yeah. can have a piece that is unique to themselves and their expression because nobody, like, like our fingerprints, no, we're not, they're not the same. Yeah. We're all unique. Yeah. So there's the beauty in that. Um, at, the t at the time, it was a frustration. But what I've come to realize over time, and even through not only my own experience, but observing others from even um, high, um, in institutions like Lysop, is yeah. the ones that always had less actually were always the most creative. Um, and I used to envy that, actually, about some of the scholarship students at Lysop. I'd be like, how is it that they had a budget of like 500 rands? This other person had a budget of 10,000 rands. And how, how, how is the 500 rand collection better than the 10? Like, I was confused. Yeah. I was genuinely confused because yeah. in my mind, it, it would equate, if you have money, you have a better collection. Yeah. But it, they completely proved me wrong. And then even on my own life journey, when I realized, oh, okay, things have actually gotten a bit tough. And if I want to keep this going, how am I... How am I going to design? How are my design processes now going to make sense for me financially, but still yeah. be able to create a quality product that doesn't look like off cuts, um, that doesn't look like secondhand? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, I hate things not looking finished, right? I want things to look it finished. Look like you're on I a want budget. Things to look, <laughs> yes, I want things to look luxury, even though I know that I was on a budget. Yeah. But how do we take this and elevate the product and make it a valuable product? Not only for myself, but for the consumer. So that's how I say I ended up falling into it because it was almost struggle. It was like struggle, struggle <laughs> culture. <laughs> I was like, girl, make it work, make it work. It tends to be like that, man. Yeah. Um, those limitations uh, mm -hmm. pull a lot out of people. Man. They do. Um, they're not, at the time, it's not like the sexiest thing, but mm. <laughs> yeah. in the long run. Mm. It, and it also it, shows you how much you're wasting when you finally yeah. get there. You're like, so I could have done it all along. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's even like that. You think yeah. of all the money you over the, the overheads you're spending all yeah. along. And you're like, so I could have made that money actually stretch. Yeah, before. you really could have maximized <laughs> on that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And then, I think one of the the most powerful things um, that I've, I've I've read that you said was. Um, your calling is to use, uh, to use fashion as a vehicle to narrate stories that minister to people. Mm. Um, at this point in your career, how do you go about conveying this in, in, in your work? Well, I always say, like, with 
creating intuitively. I do my research and everything because I always say, okay, what am I interested in this season? What's happening that has struck my attention? Yeah. You know, because as we live, we absorb. So what has struck my attention? I try to pay attention to those things um, that have struck my attention, um, focus on them until I get a trigger. That's why I don't necessarily release a collection every year. Um, yeah. I can release a collection after every two years because my approach is more so to create pieces that are timeless and last longer um, and have a aesthetic that is not based on a specific year. It's an aesthetic that can exist in any mm -hmm. year, any period. Each piece is relevant in any situation. So for me, the narratives is how I minister to people. And I actually do wait until I feel like I have a story. Even right now, as we sit here and speak, there's a story that I have. Yeah. And I've had it since last year. And I know I'm not releasing it this year. I have a feeling I'll release it next year, right? Yeah. But I'm still cooking it, I'm still working on it. Because I feel like when you're talking about ministry through fashion, it's not something that can be rushed. It's something that has to come and flow from a very authentic, genuine space. Because for me, I always say it's like a, it's creativity is spiritual work, right? And the reason I think it's spiritual work, because as someone that's intuitive and that's had ideas literally fall on her lap, yeah. you also sometimes need to make that thing cook a little bit, like a slow cooker. You know, the best stuff yeah. tastes good when it's been taken time to really like stew a little bit in there and the flavors. Yeah. And so I'll, <laughs> I'll use that as an example. So that's how I sort of like treat fashion now. Um, and I realized that implementing that has created some of the best work that I've actually put out. Yeah. Um, right now I have recently released um, an essentials collection and that's purely focusing on like less than 10 pieces that you can literally maximize. So that's meant to be like the thing that allows me to stay connected with people more regularly. Yeah. Um, rather than people waiting two, three years for me to release my main House of Stone collections and narratives. Because yeah. that's a long time for people to wait for something. Yeah. Um, but I think it's worthwhile because what I'm trying to create is, as I said, it's ministry, but it's also archive. Um, it's documenting the mood of the times. And it's telling stories that I think are relevant to that period in which it comes out. Yeah. So it's something that, yeah, needs time. Yeah. yeah I look forward to seeing that. I, yes. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so the interesting thing about that is mm. that the archiving, the telling stories of our times is, I speak to so many people in so many uh, um, industries, for lack of a better term, that are adjacent to us that are different from us mm. but there's always something that aligns us and what you're saying mm. there is like archiving te, you know just marking that moment in time that yeah. okay this is what zim looked like mm -hmm. in 2022 mm -hmm. so that's that's always like a funny thing to me but uh, going i think on, it must be birthed from the fact that when a lot of creatives started right we yeah. almost look to the past for what we want to create now or the future yeah. right and when you struggle to find the answers, you feel yeah. like there's a gap. That's uncomfortable. <laughs> we don't do a lot of that in, yeah. in Zim, like mm. archiving and yeah. having these resources at least readily available. Yeah, there's a gap. And I'm like, so you're telling me um, 20, 30, 40 years from now, when someone Googles Zimbabwe in fashion, what are they going to see? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's us. The work <laughs> exactly. that we put out now is, yeah. is going to be a part of that archive and the documenting that's going to inform future generations of their ancestors and what was relevant to us in our space at that time, what was happening yeah. in that space, what is the mood of that time. It's such important work that we create um, as, as authors. We're actually authors, historians, yeah. custodians <laughs> of, <laughs> of our nation through the arts. Yeah. You know, so... I take it quite seriously, yeah. Yeah, yeah, as you, as you should, man, <laughs> as you should. And then one of the more interesting things, or at least one of the interesting things about your work is um, your visuals are quite uh, distinct. Uh, mm. The visuals that accompany your work, uh, I would say they're quite different from uh, what we see from other fashion brands. Not like uh, to compare like yeah, in a taking down kind of way, but yeah, they're just like very different, right? Mm. Um, What's what's up with that? Like, what's the what's the thought process behind that when you sit down and you start rolling out? I think I, uh, I'm a very fantastical being. I have dreams 
that I then want to manifest through the work that I create. And I think maybe my dreams are just so wild that they come <laughs> off like. But I'm looking for, I want people to see their greatness in the work that I create. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's this effortless that comes about when I create work and I try not to force it and I try to just let it stew a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I always want that essence of effortlessness but strength to be seen and a quiet strength um, to be seen about my people, people that I come from. I think Zimbabweans, we do have that quiet strength about us. Like if you really look at everything that we've gone through over the years, <laughs> just, yeah. I don't know whether that, <laughs> some people would say it makes us docile, but um, I don't think so. I think we continue to persevere. Yeah. Uh, we could simply just sit down and cry or just burn buildings like other people do. But yeah. then what does that do? It's just another burnt building that we don't have money to fix anyways. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, Waste yeah. of time. It's always there the issues, you know? isn't it? <laughs> so I just feel like the way we continue to persevere, we're very solution-orientated people. Even the resourcefulness that I spoke to you about and how yeah. I became a sustainable designer is something that we all have. It's not yeah. just me. We always see a situation of like, my calculations are bad. <laughs> How can I make a plan, yeah. you know, to, to make this work so that I can keep, keep going? Keep going so, on. and I think there's that strength about us. And it's, the, it's that essence of a people and of a certain situation that I'm speaking into that I want to sort of bring out in my visuals. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And then... I think you've touched on this in bits and bobs, but you know, what are some of the challenges you face in, in your work? Or at least um, over, your, over the course of your career, like what are some of the things that have just frustrated you? As the creator of House of Stone, I think I'm more received internationally than I am by my own people. But I understand yeah. why. Why? Um, <laughs> as you said, my stuff is a bit different, especially yeah. the way I present it. Um, I think... In Zim, we are a bit more commercial in terms of our aesthetics. Um, it either needs to be a bodycon dress, something very colorful, something that, especially with, within the women's, yeah. the female space, something that really just is a bit more sassy. Yeah. And my stuff is not sassy in that way. It has a different sort of sass. It has a regalness, an elegance, where as much as you might not be showing everything, you're so powerful, you're still sexy, you're still all these things that you want to get from a certain aesthetic, yeah. which is fine. You can also get it at House of Stone. It's just a different way of executing and representing the power that is within. So I understand it, um, that my presentation is not one that is easily digestible for everyone, but I'm not going to change it or compromise yeah. on it because there's something that I know I'm trying to do beyond just selling a product today um, that I know within years to come will be so highly appreciated. Yeah. Um, so I'm not worried about that. Um, I'm quite good with it. I will take it to those that can digest it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, I hear you. <laughs> that's, that's basically everything. Uh, let me, no, there's, there's one more thing. <laughs> what does that process look like? Can you take me through the process of a House of Stone um, piece from inception to completion, if, if it's something? <sighs> You know what? I'm not, I'll take you through the process. Yeah. It's erratic. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I know you wanted like a point one, point two, yeah. point three, um, very structured style. And you know what? If you'd met me in 2014, I would have given you that. But now I don't have that system. Yeah. My system is firstly, what has been drawing your attention? of late, and I tend to write it down. Yeah. I write all those things. I was like, oh, I noticed these um, bottle tops. Very interesting to me. Let me put that bottle tops down. Um, oh, I really liked this weave that I saw on this carpet. Yeah. Write down weave. And I'm just like, OK, these colors, I like them. Why do you like them? Oh, they make me feel like at ease. They make me feel relaxed. So I like these colors. Yeah. I write down the colors, and I write down how they make me feel. 
then now I start to then go online and start to look for like visuals that have these elements that I've written down. Yeah. Then I print them out and then I put them on a mood board and everything. Um, and then once I see it, I kind of just leave it there for a little bit, a little marinate, and then I'm like, oh, I have an idea for the garment today. Then I make that single garment. So I don't necessarily do technical drawings or illustrations. I'll go straight to the pattern and I'll make it a pattern. So all my samples and all the things that I shoot, I make myself. When I want to really mass produce for retail, and when I say mass produce, it's actually small batch production, <laughs> like five. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll send it to I'll send those samples and my patents to the person that's going to go uh, small batch manufacture them for me. So right now it'll either be me, it'll either be charity as you've seen yeah. um, that will make those samples, and then we use those samples for photo shoots, PR, all of that stuff. All those like sample mockups, that's what they'll be used for and for future manufacture reproduction. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought of something as you were speaking there about the bottle tops. <clears throat> Is that like where the pigs are from? Because I've always <laughs> seen them and I've always like wondered. I'm like, damn, this is creative. Okay, so <laughs> the pigs. Um, woke up one day, called my friends. No, actually, woke up, yeah, woke up one day, called my friends, said, hey, do you want to do a shoot tomorrow in my mother's greenhouse? And they were like, yeah, cool, why not? They came over. And I remember we, I dressed them. I was like, ah, something feels bland. What do I have around here? <laughs> and I love that side of me because i've noticed that every time i look for what i have i always find something there's no yeah. way i cannot find something so i was like i have pegs let's put them in the hair let's just do something with them to style them <laughs> you know that's so crazy because mm -hmm. <laughs> they look custom made yes! for the shoot literally like i made them like most of the time it's, it's either like work on a budget pretty much i tend to work a lot on a budget my thing is <laughs> I don't want to spend money on this. Like, and it sounds terrible, right? Yeah. I'd rather spend money on paying a photographer, paying the actual creatives that are coming to in. Help you. But on anything, I actually would not want to spend money. If yeah. I can save a buck, that's what I do. Buck. And I think that <laughs> attitude of wanting to save a buck is what's also caused me to be a bit more creative in how I execute things and how I style and how I put things together. Yeah. Um, even the environments that I look for, I'm like, ah, oh, what do I have available to me that I can just easily access? Because I feel like a lot of time as creators, we keep telling ourselves we can't do this on Dinamari. Yeah. Um, you have a phone. <laughs> you, 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 yeah. have a phone. <laughs> you have a phone. I'm sure you have at least one cute friend. Even when I started House of Stone in the early days, 2014, I just went to my sister. I said, you, your friends want a model for me. Fun times in the yard. Catch, catch, catch. And I suddenly people were like, we love your stuff. Oh my gosh, House of Stone is... I was like, yo. <laughs> We're coming out the mud. Yeah, you, you know. <laughs> and that's the one thing that I always tell people is just work. Don't focus so much on what's happening on social media. Social media is a space of perception. Yeah. And as someone that works in the realm of fashion, art, the creativity, it's a, it's a, so it's a strong realm of perception. Um, so you might think that someone's doing way better than you, yet actually you might not be on social, but you're doing probably way better than them because you're yeah. working. You're putting in the work, you're networking, yeah. you're doing what you need to do. And yes, image does matter. Um, pay attention to it, but don't put all your attention there. Work, <laughs> do the work, because ultimately yeah. the work is what will open the doors for you that will get you into these spaces that you never imagined for yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been great yeah, talking my, to yeah, you, my man. <laughs> <laughs> It's been really great talking to you. I absolutely love this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. I hope I added value. Sure um, you did. And definitely yeah. to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> One down. <laughs> How many more to go? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Thank I'm you. Sure, I'm, yeah, I'm sure there's Very a lot of people. Very honored to be included. Uh, looking for this type of stuff. So mm. thanks for giving me the time. Yeah. And it's been vibes. Thank you.